Uh, people always want to know how you get started on this job. I guess they ask musicians, too, and actors and everything, but uh, they always want to know how you got started. They say, how did you get started? <laughs> I say to you, did you always want to be a comedian? Well, not in the womb, but right after that, yes. I do. Sure. I do. But class clown is when you really do get a chance to kind of uh, work out, you know. Because a classroom is the best place. A classroom is best because, well, no one's allowed to laugh there. And suppressed laughter, you know, is the easiest to get, the most fun. You know, like when you're kneeling in front of a casket. <laughs> during the sermon, whatever it is. And in the classroom, class clown always sounds like there was only one of them, you know? Or it sounds like the class clown, but that's not true, really. There was, you know, quite often there were two or three or four of them. <laughs> Sometimes you'd have a whole classroom full of them, yeah? If the main guy was absent, second banana would fill in, right? <laughs> yeah. And the class clown wasn't really uh, so unique. You know, he didn't necessarily do things that were real different. Uh, it was that uh, he, he learned things first. He discovered things first and passed them on to the other guys, right? Class clown was the first to discover a lot of musical things. Uh, he was the first one to get into Hawaiian nose humming, right? <laughs> Well, if you're going to play, play, you know. <laughs> and then uh, playing head. Oh, you had to be a little mazo for that anyway. You know, you know? That in throat. <sighs> Found out later in life, the beard acts as a mute for soft passages. Right. Yeah. Well, anyway. Class clown was the first guy to discover this, usually in gym class, right? Yeah. Yeah, the old artificial fart under the arm. Or as we called it in New York, the artificial fart under the arm! There were a lot of ways to make the fart sound when you were a kid. <laughs> Let me have this one, too. <laughs> and then the crook of your arm. <laughs> it was an important sound, you know? I get We found so many ways to make it, you know? I didn't need any of those fancy ones, because I could... Uh, <laughs> I was into the bilabial fricative, you know. I was so glad when I found out that had a real official name to it, man. Bronx cheer and raspberry never made it for me. Bilabial fricative. Do one from the back. It would probably be an SBD today, man. Remember that? Silent but deadly. Wow. <laughs> it's true. Most of the time in class, I was tempted to fool around, man. Get someone's. That's what it was, yeah. You'd be bored, and you'd figure, well, why not deprive someone else of their education? <laughs> and you would set about disrupting the class by... Attracting attention to yourself! <laughs> that is the name of this job, you know? It's called Dig Me. <laughs> yeah, it was like, uh, hey guys, didn't make the team, but... <laughs> yeah. Hey, he's crazy, man. Hey, you want to go to a party? Wow. Yeah, you went to all the parties. Got the last girl, but you went to all the parties, man. 
When I would uh, try to attract attention in class, it was, I wasn't really like a very daring and uh, bold youth. I was a little timid, really. I, had, uh, I didn't get right into uh, fake epileptic seizures in the aisle, you know. And <laughs> just start out and test the water a little bit. I used to start with little sounds like, uh, that's a good one because no one can really see where it's coming from, you know. You can even look around like you don't know, right? That's, of course, the pigeon. You recognize the pigeon. Uh, that was my only bird call. Because that was our only bird, you know. I was from a real New York part of New York, you know. We had pigeons and uh, sparrows. Had sparrows. Sparrows, though, you could never pin a sparrow, you know. They would leave too fast. You try to go over to a sparrow. Broom. Pigeons would walk out of your way and give you a bad look, right? <laughs> Poor pigeons, man. Their song is stuck in their throat, you know. That's what living in the city does, man. Sticks your song in your throat. I'm sure when the pigeons first got to the city, they had a nice song, man. Boo, 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 boo. A few years in the city. Whew. And then that little oil slick we laid on them. You've seen that oil slick on their neck. I'm sure we gave them that. Pidgeys. I had one sound that was my own. Not completely my own. I stole it from a Spike Jones record. None of the other guys could do that one. I added a little something to it. No one really cared, you know. Get him out of here. Will you? Get him out of here. <laughs> and then, of course, there was <laughs> popping the cheek, which everyone had to do. Just to be a kid, you had to be able to do that, right? Yeah, it was part of the credentials. Can he pop his cheek? <laughs> okay, he's a kid. Let him in. Go on. <laughs> Let me hear all of you do that. I love when a whole auditorium does it. Everybody do it like that. Just pop. Now do it without giving in to the temptation to laugh. Everybody do it without laughing. But uh, we take that for granted, you know? We think it's so simple. You say to yourself, well, I think I'll put my finger in my cheek and pop it. It's not that easy, man. There's a lot of things to think about. You gotta know how much finger to put in there for one, right? You can't do it like that, man. You have to judge the amount of finger. You have to know how much air pressure against the cheek, how much cheek pressure against the air, and when to release. Yeah, you see old guys in the park now, can't get it on anymore. That's the first thing that goes on a class clown is The cheeks, man. They never did issue microphones to the class clowns. That would have been a big help. But you had ones like this. And you remember this one? Old men always used to do this to you. Remember your grandfather would always do that. Hey, come here. I was, uh, my specialty was knuckle cracking. I was, uh, I was into it on kind of an esoteric level, really. Uh, for instance, I could crack all 28 knuckles, you know. 28 plus, actually. Only 28 are officially recognized by the Knuckle Institute. <laughs> but you aficionados know that down at the ends of the fingers, you have a lot of multiples and repeaters. And uh, <laughs> if you wake up and think about it first thing in the morning, you can do 50 or more of them, man. Yeah. A little more knuckle lore for you. The, um, the smaller the knuckle, the higher the pitch. 
something we just don't stop to think about, you know? For instance, this last knuckle on the pinky is the highest pitched knuckle. You'll hear it now. That was a double. Let's see if I can go for the double on the other pinky. I, uh, I don't often get two doubles in performance. I'd like to try. And that was down a little lower than it should have been. That's a higher pitched and much more gentle knuckle usually. Let's, let's give the right one on the end of the pinky a chance. Let's see if the other one's in there too. Ah, two doubles is far out, yeah. The best reason for cracking your knuckles was to make the girls sick. I mean, that's... That's all you wanted to do when you were nine or ten, was make the girls sick. If you could get Margaret Mary to throw up on her desk in the morning, you, know? you knew it would be a good day. You picked the most squeamish girl, right? Margaret Mary was susceptible to the knuckles. Hey, Margaret Mary! <laughs> Remember that feeling like wiping off snot? <laughs> Somebody else's. <laughs> You'd wipe it on flaming wood if you had to, man. Get it off me, it got on me by accident. <laughs> Nobody really likes your bodily fluids, you know? <laughs> That's true, unless you keep them to yourself. People don't want them. Really, think of it. Any fluids or semi-fluids that you secrete or excrete or whatever, people don't want to hear it, you know? Earwax, blood, sweat, get it out of here, man. <laughs> Sometimes they'll take your blood if they're in trouble, you know. <laughs> Otherwise, keep things inside. People want you to keep things inside. Anything you could do disgusting was good for class clown. <laughs> Ernest Cruz could turn his upper eyelids inside out, right? Wow. Remember those guys? Wow. Even I would go, Wah! Wah! Don't do that, Ernest. You look like the devil, man. John Pigman could belch at will. <laughs> Not just the ordinary belch. I mean, we all learn to swallow a little air, you know, and do the fraternity burp. Ah! But uh, John Pigman was an artist, man. He would save air for like half an hour, man. You'd see him over in the corner. Hey, John. No, no, man. <laughs> oh, and when he would finally let go. <laughs> Ladies. <laughs> oh, ladies would puke for blocks around. <laughs> he would talk when he burped. Remember those guys? How do you do, son of a bitch? <laughs> He'd try to go through the whole alphabet on one burp, right? A, B, C, D, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W. Sometimes John would be in the movie theater and you didn't know he was there. And then you found out, man. If anybody on the screen opened their mouth without saying anything, John would provide the dialogue. Hey, John's here, man. Class Clown used to save his best stuff for lunchtime when you were drinking your milk. <laughs> and he'd try to make the milk come out your nose. Huh? <laughs> oh, 
call him the best and I'll get you, man. It was even better with seven upper root beer, you know? You get all those bubbles up in their sinuses, man. One time, Michael Davy passed an entire cheese sandwich through his nose. Man. Sister Annunciata thought it was a miracle, you know? <laughs> Come with me, mister. And don't talk to the other boys and girls. Yeah, you're not allowed to talk to anyone right after a miracle, you know? You have to wait and be debriefed by a priest, right? Dun, dun, dun. Remember that? Do you still do that? Dun, dun, dun. Don't lose that, man. Dun, dun. Remember when you were a kid on a hot day, nobody was around, nothing to do? Dun, dun, dun. I still do it, man. I push the button in the elevator. Dun, dun. Watch the numerals going up. Na, 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 na. Yeah, otherwise, that's all wasted time, you know? Elevators, nothing to do in the elevator except not look at the other guy. <laughs> eh? Stare at your shoes. I play spy at the airport. Do you ever do that? I believe in using that kind of time. It's wasted time. Play spy at the airport. Especially a big airport. You know there's a spy at the airport, man. Your job? Find him. <laughs> yeah. Get into a little of this. Mm. Let's share this with you. I'll share a swallow of water with you. Why not, man? No one ever shares a swallow with you. Mm. It's a kind of a personal sound. <laughs> that second half is the best part of the swallow, you know? There are two parts. A lot of people don't realize two parts to the swallow. The first one, that, that kind of bubbly sound, is, is when you pour something in your mouth, your throat closes up. Because your throat doesn't trust your mouth, man. <laughs> your throat knows your mouth is crazy and will do anything. So your throat is kind of a monitor, and you pour something in your mouth, your throat says, hold on, let's check that stuff out. And the brain goes, looks okay to me, let her go. <laughs> Listen again for the two parts, and especially that second one, which is kind of like going home. <laughs> that was a goodie. The whole revolution is about values, values of any kind, you know? What you'll do for $10, what you'll do with $10. Really, it all comes down to values, what you value and how much. And I uh, often think of that, because you can buy anything in this country. The businessmen are the ones that really, like, kind of got the country where it is, in both ways, in the positive and the negative, man. They did, the businessmen, because there's no morality in business. Just the ledger, keep it in the black. Show a profit, keep it in the black, keep it in the black. Never mind your soul, never mind the landscape, never mind the other guy. Keep it in the black, keep it in the black, do what you can, keep it in the black. Business as usual, going on. Big plywood up there. Business as usual. Business man did it. That's right, you can buy anything in this country, man. Anything you can think of. You can probably buy a left nostril inhaler if you look around long enough. <laughs> With your state motto on it. <laughs> Clothes in the dark, anything, man. If you nail together two things that have never been nailed together before, some schmuck will buy it from you, you know? Yeah, I'll give a dollar and a half for that. Yeah, anything at all. Values. I often think of that when I go past the novelty store. You know, the novelty store, tricks, jokes, fun, fool your friends. They sell uh, the dribble glass, joy buzzer, whoopee cushion. 
called poo-poo cushion in the larger towns. You put it down. Hey, Phil fought it. Ah! It's not very big with the Shriners and American Legion are into those things. You know. They're a little retentive anyway. I guess they need devices, so why not let them have it? A lot of things for sale in that store. You know, they have a fly in an ice cube, snake matches, pepper gum, cigarette loads, big thumb with a lot of bruises on it. That's a great one. They also sell fake food, which really knocks me out. Got rubber hot dogs, plastic fried eggs. The ones I saw are made in Austria. Imagine that, imported plastic fried eggs. Wow. <laughs> plastic Swiss cheese. They have a little foam rubber sandwich with a bite missing from it. I often wonder how hungry people feel when they walk past, you know? Guys that don't have lunch money together, man. Going past the novelty store. Wow, I'd be salty. I'd be ready for a little trashing right away, you know? Start there. That's not the biggest insult. The biggest insult, however, is the, uh, the fake vomit. Imagine that, artificial vomit, wow. Some people can't scrape real vomit together, man. They're... Guys are ordering three dozen vomit on the phone, man. I've seen a couple of different brand names on that. One of them's called Glop. Another one is Whoops. Isn't that great, Whoops? It tells you where to use it, too. They have little hints on the cardboard. It's stapled to a piece of cardboard, and it tells you where to use it. On the car seat, that's a good one. On the sidewalk, naturally. Bathroom floor, they suggest there, and then the one that knocks me out is near the refrigerator. <laughs> uh, it's so strange, because some, some grown person had to think of that. Some guy was at work one day, and he said, Hey, Phil, I got another one. Near the refrigerator, huh? Beautiful, Charlie. Let me call a printer. Hey. Near the refrigerator. Wow, fake vomit. Lenny Bruce once said the reason the artificial vomit sells is because the artificial dog crap sold so well. <laughs> I grew up watching the dog crap in the window, boy. That, that was, I always thought, at first I thought a dog had gotten in the window and done it there, you know. It was always right next to the false teeth there that you wind up and let go, right? Little plaster Paris dog crap, wow. Sure is strange. How do you ask for that, you know? What do you say to the guy? I'd like to see something in a dog crap, please. Uh... Well, what did you want to spend on that? Money's no object. It's for a very good friend. I rather fancy that beige number in the window. Well, that's not beige. That's champagne gold. It's our breed of the month, Bulldog. You buy a Bulldog, we throw in a Fox Terrier free. Yeah. I imagine there would be collectors, you know, guys that had every breed. You know. Hey, you got any Saint Bernard? Yes, but there's no room in the window for that. We, uh... <laughs> the Doberman Pinscher, you'd always know the authentic Doberman Pinscher would be the one with the little pieces of clothing and buttons in it, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to include a card with that, please. Love to all, Dan. Put that on my diner's club. Do you mind gift wrapping it for me? I don't know. Sure is strange. I used to be Irish Catholic. Now I'm an American. You know, you grow. Yeah. I was from one of those Irish neighborhoods in New York. One of those kind of uh, parish schools. It wasn't typical. It was Corpus Christi was the name of it. Could have been any Catholic church, right? Our Lady of Great Agony. St. Rita Moreno. <laughs> Our Lady of Perpetual Motion. What's the difference? What's your call? You know. The church part and the neighborhood part were typical, but the school was not. It wasn't one of those old-fashioned parish kind of prison schools with a lot of corporal punishment and systemary discipline with the steel ruler, right? <laughs> you'd fall two years behind in penmanship, right? <laughs> well, he's behind in penmanship, Mrs. Carlin. I don't know why. Well, he's crippled. He's trying to learn to write with his left hand. Right? 
We didn't have that. We got, somehow I got lucky, you know, got into a, a school where the pastor was uh, kind of into John Dewey and progressive education, and he talked the parish, uh, talked the diocese, rather, into, uh, into experimenting in our parish with progressive education and whipping the religion on us anyway and see what would happen with the two of them there. And it uh, worked out kind of nice. There was a lot of classroom freedom. There was no, uh, for instance, there were no grades or marks, you know, no report cards to sweat out or any of that. Uh, there were no uniforms. There were no, there was no sexual segregation, boys and girls together, and the desks weren't all nailed down in a row, you know. They were movable desks, and you had new friends every month. It was nice. Like I say, a lot of classroom freedom. In fact, there was so much freedom that by eighth grade, many of us had lost the faith. Because <laughs> they made questioners out of us, and uh, they really didn't have any answers, you know. They'd fall back on, well, it's a mystery. <laughs> oh, thank you, Father. Mystery? I don't know. What's he talking about? mystery. Part of class clown was being an imitator, as you probably noticed, but I used to imitate the priests, which was right on the verge of blasphemy, you know. <laughs> I could do them all rather well. I did Father Byrne the best. Father Byrne was the uh, one who used to celebrate the children's mass. Oh, so that was great, celebrate mass. Yeah, 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 man. Father Byrne did the children's mass, did the sermon every week. He used to do parables about Dusty and Buddy. Dusty was a Catholic, and Buddy was not. <laughs> and Buddy was always trying to talk Dusty into having a hot dog on Friday. <laughs> and I could, uh, I could do Father Burns so well that I often wanted to do him in confession, you know? I wanted to get into Father Burns' confession on one Saturday, maybe a half hour before he showed up, and get in there and hear a few confessions, you know? Because I knew, according to my faith and religion, that if anyone came in there and really thought I was Father Byrne, and really wanted to be forgiven, and performed the penance I had assigned, <laughs> they would have been forgiven, man! Because that's what they taught us. It's what's in your mind that counts. Your intentions, that's how we'll judge you what you want to do. Mortal sin had to be a grievous offense, sufficient reflection, and full consent of the will. You had to wanna. In fact, wanna was a sin all by itself. Thou shalt not wanna. If you woke up in the morning, you said, I'm going down to 42nd Street and commit a mortal sin. Save your car fare. You did it, man. <laughs> Absolutely. It was a sin for you to want to feel up Ellen. It was a sin for you to plan to feel up Ellen. It was a sin for you to figure out a place to feel up Ellen. It was a sin to take Ellen to the place to feel her up. It was a sin to try to feel her up. And it was a sin to feel her up. There was six sins in one field, man. <laughs> But confession had another, uh, there was another aspect to confession for me. Our neighborhood was right between Columbia University and Harlem, Juilliard School of Music, Grant's Tomb, uh, two seminaries, Jewish Theological and Union Theological Seminary. I said Harlem was there, and then to the north, a Puerto Rican and Cuban section. And as Puerto Ricans began to move into our neighborhood, the diocese, in a dis rare display of tokenism in the early 50s, sent one Spanish priest, Father Rivera, to hear Spanish confessions. And all the Irish guys that were heavily into puberty <laughs> would go to confession to Father Rivera because he didn't seem to understand the sins, you know? Or at least he didn't take them personally, you know? It wasn't an affront to him. He was no big theological harangue. He didn't chew you out. He was known as a light penance. In and out, three Hail Marys, you're back on the street with Father Rivera, man. Boom, right? Boom. You could see the line move. That's how fast he was working. Right? <laughs> but he wasn't ready for the way Irish boys were confessing at that time in that place. Huh? Well, bless me, Father, for I've sinned. Uh, I would have touched myself in an impure manner. <laughs> uh, I was impure, uh, impurity and impureness. Thought, word, and deed, body, touch, impure, sex, dirty. Uh, impure legs, impureness, touch, impure, dirty body, sex, rub, and covet. Heavy on the covet, Father. Uh... That's okay, man. Tres Ave Marias. <laughs> you 
to be home in five minutes, you know? The Irish priest, on the other hand, nice guy, but uh, first of all, he recognized your voice because you'd grown up there, you're right? He knew everyone. What'd you do that for, George? Oh, God, he knows, man. <laughs> And the Irish priests were always heavily into penance and punishment, you know? They'd give you a couple of novenas to do, a nine first Fridays, five first Saturdays, stations of the cross, a trip to Lourdes, wow. <laughs> that was one of the things that bothered me a little about uh, my religion, was that conflict between pain and pleasure, you know? Because they were always pushing for pain, and you were always pulling for pleasure, man. You know? <laughs> There were, uh, there were other things that, that bothered me. Perhaps it's uh, retrospect, you know, I'm, I'm seeing them better now. But I think I was troubled, too, at the time by the fact that my, my church would keep changing rules. I mean, they'd change a rule any time they wanted. This law is eternal, except for this weekend. Special dispensation. Magic words. Yeah, like eating meat on Friday was definitely a sin. Except for the people in Philadelphia. They were number one in the scrap iron drive. Yeah. <laughs> they would give it away as a prize, you know? If your parish gave the most money to the Bishop's Relief Fund, hamburgers on Friday, yeah. <laughs> wow, and of course, I've been gone a long time now. It's not even a sin anymore to eat meat on Friday. But I'll bet you there are still some guys in hell doing time on a meat wrap, right? <laughs> Gotta be there, yeah. I thought it was retroactive. I had a bologna sandwich. This guy had a beef jerky, right? Huh. Tell him what you had. How would you like to do eternity for a beef jerky? Yeah, because yeah. yeah, hell wasn't no five to 10, you know. Hell was later. Heaven, hell, purgatory, and limbo. Those were the four big places to go. Yeah. Heaven was the only one they showed you pictures of. Drawings, I assume they were drawings, right? Artist's conception of heaven. You'd find that in, uh, sometimes you'd find that in Treasure Chest, the comic book with Chuck White, the Catholic comic book. Yeah, Chuck White fan. Yeah, occasionally you'd see a picture of heaven. Heaven was always a lot of yellow and white light, a lot of vertical lines. A lot of clouds, might have been clouds, might have been apartment buildings, you weren't really sure, you know. And a lot of tall angels, did you ever notice that? Except for the cherubs, all the angels, real tall dudes, yeah. And all blonde, they had far too many blondes in heaven as far as I was concerned. Yeah. Hell, they never showed you any pictures of hell. Hell was real easy to understand. Hell was fire and anyone can dig fire, right? Yeah. Hey, hell is like burning a hundred Christmas trees and jumping right in the middle, you know? Purgatory was weird. Purgatory was temporary hell. It was like it was as bad as hell, but you knew you were going home, man. <laughs> Often wondered if they had like short time clubs in purgatory, you know? Little buttons. I'm short, two eons, man. Yeah. I could do an eon standing on my head, man. <laughs> purgatory. The weirdest of all was limbo. Limbo was where they sent unbaptized babies. The reasoning was it wasn't their fault. Yep, can't see God if you're not baptized, but you were too young to make the decision. Whip him into limbo. <laughs> what could limbo have been, man? <laughs> Welcome to limbo. <laughs> I think they've since canceled limbo. I'm not completely sure, but I think when they uh, purged a few of the saints, they called off limbo, too. Yeah. Hope they promoted everyone, sent them to heaven, you know, didn't, didn't just cut them loose in space, right? You know. <laughs> Once a week, Father Russell would come in for heavy mystery time. And you'd save all your weird questions for Father Russell. In fact, you'd make up strange questions. You'd, Take a whole week thinking up trick questions to Father Russell. Hey, hey, Father! Hey, uh, if God is all-powerful, can he make a rock so big that he himself can't lift it? Ah! Hey! We got him now! Ah! 
or else you'd take a very simple sin and surround it with the most bizarre circumstances you could imagine to try to, you know, relieve the guilt in the sin. It would usually end up with the uh, statement, would that then be a sin then, Father? It's like here, this is an example. There was one sin, not receiving communion during Easter time. You had to perform your Easter duty. You had to receive once between Ash Wednesday and Pentecost Sunday. And if you didn't do it, it was a mortal sin. Providing, of course, you had said to yourself, hey, I'm not going to do it this year. <laughs> and uh, there weren't many mortal sins on that, but a lot of guys went to Venial City on Easter duty. <laughs> and so you would uh, ask the priest, you know, you'd go, hey, Father, hey, uh... Remember guys who would leave their hand up after they got called on, right? <laughs> And the priest would say, what are you, the Statue of Liberty done? Oh, sorry, Father. <laughs> Anyways, Father, hey, uh, suppose that you didn't make your Easter duty, and it's Pentecost Sunday, the last day, and you're on a ship at sea, <laughs> and the chaplain goes into a coma. <laughs> but you wanted to receive, and then it's Monday, too late. But then you cross the international date line. <laughs> yes, I'm sure God will take that into account. Sit down, will he? <laughs> Muhammad Ali, Muhammad Ali, Muhammad Ali. It's a nice musical name, Muhammad Ali. He's back at work again. He's being allowed to work once again, Muhammad Ali. He wasn't for a while, as you know. For about three and a half years, they didn't let him work. Of course, he had an unusual job, beating people up. <laughs> it's a strange calling, you know. But it's one you're entitled to. Government didn't see it that way. Government wanted him to change jobs. Government wanted him to kill people. <laughs> he said, no, that's where I draw the line. I'll beat him up, but I don't want to kill him. And the government... <laughs> the government said, well, if you won't kill him, we won't let you beat him up. Ah. It was a spiteful move, you know. All because he didn't want to go to Vietnam. And now, of course, we're leaving Vietnam. <laughs> We're leaving through Laos, Cambodia, and Thailand. It's the overland route. It's the long way out. You gotta go through China and Russia to get out that way. What are we gonna tell them, man? We'll only be here six weeks just looking for the Ho Chi Minh Trail. <laughs> well, maybe they'll go for it, you know. Of course, you have to remember why we're over there in the first place. comes to me to free those people so they can have industry yeah. US industry yeah. those are the middle two letters of the word industry US and that is our job around the world run in free some people and whip a little industry on them here's your industry cool it a while will you so they can enjoy the benefits of industry that we have come to enjoy <laughs> Oh, beautiful for smoggy skies, insecticided grain, for strip mined mountains, majesty above the asphalt plain. America, America, man sheds his waste on thee and hides the pines with billboard signs from sea to oily sea. <laughs> Then you have to remember the sexual side of Vietnam, which a lot of people don't notice. The Hearst newspapers notice it, of course. Yes, they're into sex on anything. I mean, you check the wishing well or the sewing patterns and there's a little something in there. So. But they're always afraid of pulling out. That's their big problem, you know? Pull out doesn't sound manly to me, Bill. I'd say leave it in there and let's get the job done. 
Because that is, after all, what we're doing to that country, right? Yeah. And we have always been good at that, you must admit. We uh, took, care of, uh, took care of the blacks, took care of the Indians. I consider the South just another minority that was screwed by the U.S. government. I have no prejudice against them. They got it too. Ba -dum. We really gave the Indians a fast trip across the continent. You notice that? They were having a little cookout in Massachusetts. Bunch of boats came up, man. Hey, you mind moving over, guys? Bring in the stuff. Would you move over? Would you mind bringing the stuff, man? Would you move over, man? Bring in the stuff. Come on, man. Move it over. Would you mind over three mountain ranges, four mountain ranges? Got them onto an offshore island, Alcatraz, right? Off the continent completely. They had to take the island to get it. Then we kicked them off there. I guess we're going to send them back where they came from. Yeah, we must, yeah, we bought the Bering Strait theory, right? Put them welfare people to work filling in the Bering Strait and charge them Indians a buck a head to go home. It's a good sound business solution. I love words. I thank you for hearing my words. I want to tell you something about words that I, uh, I think is important. I love, as I say, they're my uh, work, they're my play, they're my passion. Words are all we have, really. Uh, we have thoughts, but thoughts are fluid, you know. And then we assign a word to a thought. And we're stuck with that word for that thought. So be careful with words. I like to think, yeah, the same words, you know, that hurt can heal. It's a, it's a matter of how you pick them. There are some people that aren't into all the words. There are some people that would have you not use certain words. Yeah, there are 400,000 words in the English language, and there are seven of them you can't say on television. What a ratio that is. 399,993 to seven. <laughs> they must really be bad. They'd have to be outrageous to be separated from a group that large. All of you over here, you seven. Bad words. That's what they told us they were, remember? That's a bad word. <laughs> No bad words, bad thoughts, bad intentions, and words. You know the seven, don't you, that you can't say on television? Shit, piss, fuck, cunt, cocksucker, motherfucker, and tits, huh? <laughs> Those are the heavy seven. Those are the ones that'll infect your soul. Curve your spine and keep the country from winning the war. Shit, piss, fuck, cunt, cocksucker, motherfucker, and tits. Wow. And tits doesn't even belong on the list, you know? Yeah. It's such a friendly sounding word. Sounds like a nickname, right? Hey, tits, come here, man. Hey, tits. Hey. Hey, tits, me toots, toots, tits, 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 man. Sounds like a snack, doesn't it, huh? Yes, yes I know, it is, right, a snack. <laughs> but I don't mean your sexist snack. I mean new Nabisco tits. <laughs> the new cheese tits. The corn tits and pizza tits and sesame tits, onion tits, tater tits. <laughs> Yeah. Bet you can't eat just one. Huh? That's true, I usually switch off. <laughs> but I mean, that word does not belong on the list. Actually, none of the words belong on the list, but you can understand why some of them are there. I mean, I'm not completely insensitive to people's feelings. You know, I can dig why some of those words got on the list. Like cocksucker and motherfucker, those are... Those are heavyweight words, you know. Oh, there's a lot going on there, man. Besides the literal translation and, and the emotional feeling, I mean, they're just busy words. You know? There's a lot of syllables to contend with. And, and those K's, those are aggressive sounds. They jump out at you, man. Cocksucker, motherfucker, cocksucker, oh. It's like an assault on you, you know? So I can dig that. 
Now, we mentioned shit earlier, of course, and uh, two of the other four-letter Anglo-Saxon words are piss and cunt, which go together, of course, but forget that. <laughs> so, little accidental humor I throw there. Piss and cunt. The reason that piss and cunt are on the list is that a long time ago, certain ladies said, those are the two I'm not going to say. I don't mind fucking shit, but P and C are out. P and C are out. Which led to such stupid sentences as, okay, you fuckers, I'm going to tinkle now. <laughs> and of course, the word fuck. The word fuck, I don't really, well, here's some more accidental humor. I don't really want to get into that now. <sighs> because I think it takes too long. <sighs> but I do mean that. I mean, I think the word fuck is a very important word. It's the beginning of life, and yet it's a word we use to hurt one another quite often. And uh, people much wiser than I have said, I'd rather have my son watch a film with two people making love than two people trying to kill one another. And I, of course, can agree. It's a great sentiment. I wish I knew who said it first, and I, I agree with that. But I'd like to take it a step further. I'd like to substitute the word fuck for the word kill in all those movie cliches we grew up with, right? Okay, Sheriff, we're gonna fuck you now. <laughs> But we're gonna fuck you slow. So maybe next year I'll have a whole fucking rap on that word, and I hope so. Uh, there are two-way words. Those are the seven you can never say on television. Under any circumstances, you just cannot say them ever, 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 not even clinically. You cannot weave them in on the panel with Doc and Ed and Johnny. I mean, it's just impossible. Forget those seven, they're out. But there are some two-way words, those double-meaning words. Remember the ones you giggled at in sixth grade? And the cock crowed three times. Hey, the cock crowed three times. Hey, hey it's in the Bible. Hey. There are some two-way words, like it's okay for Kurt Gowdy to say, Roberto Clemente has two balls on him. <laughs> but he can't say, I think he hurt his balls on that play, Tony, don't you? <laughs> He's holding them. He must have hurt them, by God. And the other two-way word that goes with that one is prick. It's okay if it happens to your finger. Yes, you can prick your finger, but don't finger your prick. No, no. Uh -huh.